Hi, I'm Katie Stein. Welcome to Dystopia. This is the sixth in a series of videos designed to open new pathways into dystopianism for those unsure where to begin, or for the hardened dystopians out there to offer an opportunity to return to first principles and try and work out what drew you to the genre in the first place. There are more learning resources, reading lists, ways to get more involved on my website at katiemcgregorstone.co.uk. But for now, wherever you are on your journey with dystopianism and however much time and energy you have for this today, you're welcome. So this is the, the second video um, that I'm making about space and dystopias. What are the, the spaces that dystopian writers and thinkers imagine and create? Um, and what are the real life spaces which influence them? I recommend that you watch the previous video um, first to give you give you more of a view, but hopefully you can get something out of this one if you're just dipping in. Um, the novel that I'm going to be talking about to discuss space is um, the novel We, um, published by the Russian author Yevgeny Zamyatin in 1924. Um, it's a, very much a classic of the dystopian genre and thought to be one of the first dystopian novels. Um, for those who need a quick recap on its contents, We takes place in a distant future after the 200 years war has ravaged the human population. Um, the remaining civilization, at least that we're aware about in the novel, um, is called One State takes the form of a great glass city surrounded by a green wall um, where none of the inhabitants ever leave. It's utterly self-sustaining. Um, in this glass city, people don't have names, they have numbers. Um, they uh, can see one another at all times and they can be seen, so the city is totally glass. Um, and each of them have one room um, which they, they uh, live in and which is utterly identical to all of the other rooms. Um, so this is a very heavily controlled space. Um, the story follows D503, one of the numbers, um, who, who is the architect of the Integral, the spaceship that one state is going to send up into the solar system to, to spread the good word of this society governed entirely by the principles of efficiency designed to run as smoothly as a machine. Um, and we, along with D503, uh, um, follow him on his, his journey as he moves from being a true believer um, in the idea that this is a utopia that he's living in um, through his contact with uh, various rebel groups and in particular a woman named I-330 um, who is a revolutionary. He starts to see this as an increasingly dystopian space. He becomes, he becomes a doubter, becomes a dissident. So unfortunately, I don't read Russian, so I haven't read We in, in its original form. Um, so I'm using the 1993 English translation, which was produced by Clarence Brown. That's where all the quotations in this video are from. And then to illustrate these points, I'm going to be um, including some stills from the 1982 German TV film adaptation, Veer. Um, as you can see by the quality of the, uh, the poster image here, um, this is not a very watched film, it's quite obscure. Um, you can watch it all on YouTube, which I do recommend because it's, it's strange, but it's interesting. Um, but I think it has some, some very striking images and, and hopefully it will, it will give some insight into to what the spaces of this text look like. So I'm going to be focusing in this video on spaces of punishment um, in, in we. What kind of spaces uh, do the, the state's apparatus of, of judging um, 
and disciplining criminals? What kind of spaces is that done in and what does that tell us more broadly about dystopianism? And in order to answer some of these questions, I'm going to be referring in depth to Michel Foucault's book, Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prism. Um, so Foucault is a, is a very well-known French theorist and philosopher, um, and Discipline and Punish is read um, by people in, of all different um, professions, so by historians, by sociologists, by philosophers. Um, there are many videos actually which give very detailed chapter by chapter breakdowns of Discipline and Punish and I'll include links to some of those um, in the description of this video. Um, but uh, I'm going to be focusing on, on how uh, Foucault discusses the different um, spaces of punishment um, and how we can apply those ideas to, to we. Um, I do recommend this book. It's quite long. Some of it is quite um, challenging. Foucault's writing for people who are who are used to, to reading um, philosophy and, and theory books. But uh, much of it is is um, simple um, and and very entertaining. I think Foucault is quite quite funny um, in lots of ways, although I would say that it also does contain some very distressing imagery. The first section is called torture and Foucault does describe some tortures in detail. So be aware of that if you do desire uh, do you decide to delve any deeper? I will be referencing um, torture and execution in this video, but I won't be going um, into too much detail here. Um, so in my discussion of Foucault, I'm going to begin by by summarising my understanding of his, his central thesis, um, what he thinks about the birth of the prison, the development of this particular um, mechanism for um, policing crime, for controlling the population. Um, and then I'm going to apply those ideas to we and see how they, they track on to Zamyatin's um, depiction of dystopias. Um, and then I'm going to end by thinking again about the relationship between dystopia and utopia uh, and how these depictions of spaces of punishment um, track on to yeah, dystopia, dystopia's relationship to utopia. Um, so to begin, I'm going to um, start off with what Foucault has to say about prisons and about the space of the prison. Um, he, he describes prisons as an architecture that is no longer built simply to be seen, as with the ostentation of palaces, or to observe the external space, cf the geometry of fortresses, but to permit an internal, articulated and detailed control to render visible those who are inside it. In more general terms, an architecture that would operate to transform individuals, to act on those it shelters, to provide a hold on their conduct, to carry the effects of power right to them, to make it possible to know them, to alter them. So this, I argue, is what we see in the dystopian city of we. Um, in the great glass city, which is designed so that everyone in it can be seen, to control their movements, to regulate them, um, to discipline them. Um, and this is, this is kind of key to my understanding of how Foucault's uh, work relates to dystopias. He, he associates prison um, with what he calls the disciplinary society. So he says it's, n it's not just in the building of prisons um, that we see these methods of control um, through space, through architecture. We also see them in factories, we see them in schools, uh, we see them in hospitals. Um, and it's this kind of control of space that, that I argue um, we see in dystopias. So I think there's a big overlap between um, the dystopian society and the disciplinary society. 
and that really comes together in this image of the the great glass city as a as a prison but what Foucault is is interested in is not just looking at prisons but in seeing how they came to be how France which is his subject moved from a system which was uh, where the, the central form of, of punishment um, was not, it's not the most popular form of punishment, but Foucault argues the most important was execution, right? Hanging, hanging people um, to imprisoning them. Um, it didn't used to be standard to lock people up. Um, and uh, before the French Revolution, so in the, in the 18th century, um, prisons were, were rare, and Foucault wants to talk about how um, how they came to be and how they came to be so popular. Um, so he starts Discipline and Punish with a description of an execution, of the execution of Robert Francois Damien, who's known as Damien the Regicide. He's a man who tried to kill the King of France and who in 1757 was executed in public in this really grotesque way and I won't go into the details of it but um, you know this was someone who was pulled apart um, so Foucault says you know this is an example of what punishment was like in 1757 but this is not how punishment remained Foucault notes that 80 years later Leon Faucher drew up his rules for the house of young prisoners in Paris Article 17, the prisoner's day will begin at six in the morning in winter and at five in summer. They will work for nine hours a day throughout the year. Two hours a day will be devoted to instruction. Work and the day will end at nine o'clock in winter and at eight in summer. Article 18, rising. At the first drum roll, the prisoners must rise and dress in silence as the supervisor opens the cell doors. At the second drum roll, they must be dressed and make their beds. At the third, they must line up and proceed to the chapel for morning prayer. There is a five minute interval between each drum roll. And this description goes on and on. I won't include it all, but every minute of the day um, is is itemized and regulated um, within this house of young prisoners. So what Foucault says is we have then a public execution and a timetable. They do not punish the same crimes or the same type of delinquent, but they each define a certain penal style. Less than a century separates them. So the scaffold, where the body of the tortured criminal had been exposed to the ritually manifested force of the sovereign, the punitive theatre in which the representation of punishment was permanently available to the social body was replaced by a great enclosed complex and hierarchized structure that was integrated into the very body of the state apparatus. So breaking this down a little bit, um, he sees the scaffold as this spectacle this space um, where someone was up on a platform they could be seen by everybody um, and the sovereign the king or the queen showed everyone how powerful they were by taking revenge on the person of the criminal um, by ripping them apart by torturing them and everyone would see this and be afraid um, whereas the prison um, is a space that you can't look into. It's enclosed. Um, punishment doesn't become about taking some exceptional criminals and punishing them in this extreme and violent way. It becomes about managing these large populations and enclosing them. And as we've said before, it's not just in prisons, it's in the very body of the state apparatus. Um, it's through all surveillance systems, all management systems. Um, so this is this is what Foucault um, says is the disciplinary society, this society which is governed using the logic, not of the execution, not of this display of sovereign power, but through the logic of prisons. He says in the disciplinary society, the power to judge should no longer depend on the innumerable, discontinuous, sometimes contradictory 
privileges of sovereignty so the whims of the king or queen whether they're in a bad mood whether they dislike this particular person um, but on the continuously distributed effects of public power the goal of prisons is not to punish less but to punish better to punish with an attenuated severity perhaps less harshly but in order to punish with more universality and necessity to insert the power to punish more deeply into the social body so he's encouraging his readers not to think oh society became more civilized it became more gentle so there was less punishment because look no one's being ripped apart in public anymore no one's being publicly tortured um so it must be nicer now there must be less punishment and what Foucault is saying is there's actually more punishment and he knows it's not universal. There are, you know, obviously um, classed and raced and gendered dynamics in terms of who is punished and how and how much. Um, but nevertheless, the system of punishment, um, which prisons are based on, um, is this more universal punishment. Um, this this method of punishment which is which is more spread out so that you don't have this one instance of really extreme punishment instead you have things like these timetables where every part of your day is monitored and controlled um, so this is his basic idea that we move from the the system of of torture of public executions to a system of imprisonment of surveillance of discipline um, and this is why i'm suggesting dystopias do is that they are part of the disciplined end of that spectrum so we're gonna test this idea out now we're gonna we're gonna look back at we and we're gonna see the methods of punishment that are used in one state and how they track on to foucault's thinking we're gonna see how to punish a dystopian so this is a description that D503 gives of, of one of his one of his days in one state. He says this is a bright, triumphant day on a day like today. You forget about your weaknesses, your uncertainties, your illnesses, and everything is crystalline, steadfast, everlasting, like our new glass cube square. 66 powerful concentric rings the stands and 66 rows quiet faces like lamps with eyes reflecting the shining heavens or maybe the shining of one state judging by the descriptions that have come down to us this is something like what the ancients felt during their divine service but they serve their irrational unknown god whereas we serve something rational and very precisely known there was one standing on the steps of the cube, the sunlight pouring down on him. His hands were tied with a purple ribbon. Ancient custom. The explanation seems to be that in old times, before this was done in the name of one state, the condemned naturally thought he had a right to put up a fight. So his hands were usually chained. So this is a scene of, of execution. He's imagined here naked in, in the German film, although I'm not sure that's, that's in Zamyatin's novel. Um, but this is a condemned man. Um, and he, the poets of one state talk about the greatness of the state. And then the condemned man is set to lie on the machine and he is instantaneously killed. He is melted and he becomes water at once. Um, so this is a scene of execution. And this would seem, I think, to go against what I've been saying, um, because I've been saying that the spaces of punishment and dystopias are prisons, not executions. But here we have a public execution. So how can we how can we explain that? Is this just a, a relic or leftover um, or how can we how can we integrating it into our understanding of dystopias in line with Foucault's disciplinary society? Um, well, I'm going to argue that, that Foucault does actually provide um, a way of a way of integrating the public execution into a dystopian society. And that is through not the scaffold where people are hanged, but through the guillotine. So Foucault describes the, the principles of the disciplinary societies as part of a utopia of judicial reticence take away life but prevent the patient from feeling it deprive the prisoner of all rights 
but do not inflict pain. And he says the guillotine, first used in March 1792, was the perfect vehicle for these principles. Death was reduced to a visible but instantaneous event. Contact between the law, or those who carry it out, and the body of the criminal is reduced to a split second. There is no physical confrontation. The executioner need be no more than a meticulous watchmaker. And he says that despite cruelties that are strongly reminiscent of the tortures of the Ancien Regime, it's the period in France before the French Revolution, a quite different mechanism is at work in these analogical penalties. So he's saying the guillotine, it's still a public execution, right? It seems the same as the hanging on the scaffold. But he's saying that there is a difference. This is a different mechanism. And one of the differences is this idea of it becoming a machine, becoming mechanised. So you're not trying to inflict pain. You're not trying to torture someone. You're trying to kill them as quickly and efficiently as possible with the manner of the meticulous watchmaker. There's also another difference. Um, and this is, as Foucault puts it, that in a disciplinary society, the right to punish has been shifted from the vengeance of the sovereign to the defence of society. Um, so he goes on to say, committing a crime now opposes an individual to the entire social body. In order to punish him, society has the right to oppose him in its entirety. It is an unequal struggle. On one side are all the forces, all the power, all the rights. A formidable right to punish is established since the offender becomes the common enemy. Indeed, he is worse than an enemy, for it is from within society that he delivers his blows. He is nothing less than a traitor, a monster. So what Foucault is saying here is that it used to be with the scaffold, with the public torture, that the king or the queen, the sovereign, would be taking revenge on the criminal. And they would be doing so in order to, to frighten the rest of the people, to show them their power um, and to show them what could happen to them. Whereas with the execution of the guillotine, it is the people who are doing the punishing. Um, they're punishing an individual and, and viewing the individual as committing a crime, not against the king or the queen and the laws that they've written, um, but against the entire social body. On one side, all the forces, all the power, all the rights. On the other, that the criminal has been made an example of. Right. So I'm arguing that this helps us to to understand Zamyatin. I think this is very in line with the justification that D503 gives about why the people of we, the numbers, view themselves as we rather than as individuals. He says, even among the ancients, the more grown up knew that the source of right is power, that right is a function of power. So take some scales and put on one side a gram, on the other a ton, on one side I, and on the other we, one state. It's clear, isn't it? To assert that I has certain rights with respect to the state is exactly the same as asserting that a gram weighs the same as a ton. That explains the way things are divided up. To the ton go the rights, to the gram the duties. And the natural pass from nullity to greatness, so from nothing to everything, is this. Forget that you're a gram and feel yourself a millionth part of a ton. So this is the all the rights being on one side with the crowd, with the people, with the state. Um, and D503 applies this to his, his explanation for why there are still executions in one state. He says in one state, the verdict is the same for all crime premature death. This is the very same divine justice dreamt of by the people of the Stonehouse Age, so he calls us, illuminated by the rosy, naive rays of the dawn of history. Their God punished abuse of Holy Church exactly the same as murder. So then he says, human history ascends in spirals like an arrow, so their flying ships move in spirals. The circles vary, some are gold, some are bloody, but all are divided into the same 360 degrees. It starts at zero and goes forward, 10, 20, 200, 360 degrees, then back to zero. Yes, we've come back to zero, yes, 
But for my mind, thinking in mathematics as it does, one thing is clear. This zero is completely different, new. So this is how I explain, essentially, um, the, the kind of that we still see these public executions in um, the dystopian society of one state. Um, it's, it's as D503 says, it looks the same as the old public execution, um, but really it's something new. They've come around to doing the same thing, but they're doing it for a different reason or in a different way. And obviously we could critique this and say, well, maybe it's not that different really. Maybe this is, this is just still the example of the, um, the state violently wreaking vengeance on the body of the people. And in one sense it is, but I think this goes some way to show how you can have executions and prisons, these different spaces of punishment coexisting without kind of undermining one another. Um, and making up still this idea of the dystopian disciplinary space. So we're going to um, move now to thinking about uh, dystopia's relationship to, to utopia. And I've said before that dystopias serve both to critique utopias, utopias that are, um, that are authoritarian, that are nostalgic, that are bordered and still dystopias remain kind of committed to a utopian horizon. They still see a better world. But we're going to start off with the critique. And we're going to think about how punishment, the spaces of punishment, relate to utopias. So we're going to see how to punish a utopian. Um, so Foucault addresses this idea of utopia and he writes, Historians of ideas usually attribute the dream of a perfect society to the philosophers and jurists of the 18th century. But there was also a military dream of society. Its fundamental reference was not to the state of nature, but to the meticulously subordinated cogs of a machine, not to the primal social contract, but to permanent coercions, not to fundamental rights, but to indefinitely progressive forms of training, not to the general will, but to automatic docility. So he's saying that there isn't, utopias aren't just about being free and natural and, and full of fundamental rights. There is another dream of society, another kind of utopia, which is, is this military dream of subordinated cogs in a machine. Um, and this is this is the form of utopia that one state aspires to in we. Um, this is the benefactor speaking. So he's kind of the figurehead for one state. Um, and he says, what is it that people beg for, dream about, torment themselves for from the time they leave swaddling clothes? They want someone to tell them once and for all what happiness is and then to bind them to that happiness with a chain. What is it we're doing right now, if not that? The ancient dream of paradise? Remember, in paradise they've lost all knowledge of desires, pity, love. They are the blessed, with their imagination surgically removed. The only reason why they are blessed. So he's saying that, that paradise isn't about um, natural freedom. It's about being chained to happiness. Um, and interestingly, when he says having your imagination surgically removed, he's not speaking metaphorically here. Um, the, the culmination of we um, sees the implementation of what they call the great operation, where people are essentially being lobotomized. Um, so you can see that here, people are having their brains operated on to make them more compliant, to make them more docile. This is the, the most universal form of punishment, whether the prison is entering even the minds of the people um, so that they are even more content to exist within their, their tiny little glass walls. So as not to end on this um, very, very depressing vision of a totally disciplined, totally imprisoned population. I'm going to end with these words from Foucault on revolt. Um, so Foucault is writing about, uh, he's critiquing dystopianism, he's, uh, sorry, he's critiquing the disciplinary society, he's critiquing a form of dystopia, um, 
in the form of prisons and mass incarceration. Um, but he's, he's not just writing as an academic, he's also writing as someone who is very interested and invested in the prison revolts, which were sweeping France in the 1970s and the, the prisoner-led revolutionary movements. Um, so partly why he's writing Discipline and Punishment is as a, as a way of understanding what it is that the prisoners want and, and demonstrating um, uh, how, their, how their aims line up with the history of prisons. So I'm going to end with Foucault's words here on the, the revolting prisoners. He writes, In recent years, prison revolts have occurred throughout the world. There was certainly something paradoxical about their aims, their slogans and the way they took place. They were revolts against an entire state of physical misery that is over a century old, against cold, suffocation and overcrowding, against decrepit walls, hunger, physical maltreatment. But they were also revolts against model prisons, tranquilizers, isolation, the medical or educational services. Were they revolts whose aims were merely material or contradictory revolts against the obsolete, but also against comfort, against the warders, but also against the psychiatrists? In fact, all these movements have been about the body and material things. One may, if one is so disposed, see them as no more than blind demands or suspect the existence behind them of an alien strategies. In fact, they were revolts at the level of the body against the very body of the prison. What was at issue was not whether the prison environment was too harsh or too aseptic, too primitive or too efficient, but its very materiality as an instrument and vector of power. It is this whole technology of power over the body that the technology of the soul that of the educationalists, psychologists and psychiatrists fails either to conceal or to compensate for the simple reason that it is one of its tools. Um, so this is the idea that I want to leave you with, um, that, that Foucault is talking about spaces of punishment, about executions, about prisons. Um, as as forms of forms of violence forms of control um, and that both ends of the spectrum from torture to the timetable governing how prisoners um, live their lives um, are violent forms of control which should be revolted against the the prisoners in france in the 1970s um, were were saying no not just to uh cold uh decrepit old prisons with their harsh and brutal guards they were also saying no to the new clean efficient prisons run by doctors and teachers um, they were saying no to the prison as a whole, to this dystopian space of punishment. Um, so I'm going to leave this there. In the next pair of videos, I'm going to be talking about the control of time in dystopias. Um, and the example text I'll be using is Boots Riley's 2018 film, Sorry to Bother You. But for now, thank you and you're welcome. <laughs>